I on? Yes, I am. Great. Well, if, you, uh, if you've looked at the notice sheet and if you uh, were reading the slides before the start of the service, you'll know that today we're beginning our journey through the letter of James. Thank you, Dean, for reading those first 18 chapters this morning. This is going to take us through 18 verses. Did I say chapters? <laughs> Thank you for reading 18 verses. We'd still be here. Oh, there is 19 chapters in James anyway, is there? Right, let's start again. <laughs> It's going to take us through to the first Sunday of November. So we're going to spend a good chunk of the autumn on this particular book. I'm under no illusion, friends, that this is going to be a challenging series as we get to grips with what James contains. Because he's often seen, as Tom Wright describes him, as the practical man among the New Testament writers. However... If we were to take a step back from the way we've divided it up over the coming weeks, in many ways, the way we've split it is down to the translators who've inserted headings, who've inserted verses, and who've inserted chapters, not 18. But we need to remember that ultimately this is a letter by a Christian to Christians. So I want to encourage you, over the next week, take some time to sit and read James from start to finish as a letter as it was originally intended to be heard, not broken up in the way our translators have broken it up. Because it will help us to get a better understanding of the context of the letter, of the flow of the writing, of how James is writing it, and then what I hope we discover is that ultimately this letter is about relationships. So you may be wondering, why now? Well, for this series, I've actually borrowed from Spring Harvest. And I'm, I, in 2018, they did a series on James called Only the Brave with the subtitle Determined Discipleship. And it's always stuck with me as that theme of being determined disciples. And I think it's really important for us in today's day and age that we are determined disciples. I was going to show you the book today, but I haven't got it. I realize it's still with my training incumbent five years later. But if you would like a copy of the book, ask Carol. I'm assuming she can get hold of it. Other retailers are available. Another thing you might like to do as we journey through James is there are plenty of resources, like um, Bible study guides, to go through this, the book. And I've actually been using this one. from Again, this is from Spring Harvest from six years ago. Uh, as, a, as a guide to go through the letter and see what it, what it pulls out. So I'd encourage you, if you want to get hold of one of those, this is called Brave Faith and Works. I'll send out the ISBNs and links after the service. Now it's worth saying, though, at this point in time, that we don't know for sure who James is. It is very, very likely that this is written by the James from the early church, the brother of Jesus, the strong central leader of the Jerusalem church over the first 30 years of Christianity. We see Peter, Paul, and the others go off around the world to share the gospel, but James stays put in Jerusalem. He prays, he teaches, and trusts that God who raised his brother from the dead would complete what had been started. And it's likely that this letter was written as a part of that work, written to encourage Christians across the world to face up to the challenge of faith. So what we see as we go through this is it's about discipleship. It's about our relationship. Now, a few weeks back, before the summer, we were talking about mission, and we had our gift day, and we were very grateful for the amount that was raised. But before we can go out there into the community, we have to get our relationships right in here. So we're going to start by spending this time on James looking at discipleship before it, hopefully in the new year we start looking at missional activities and getting out and doing what we need to do out there because we can't just focus on ourselves in here because if we do, then there's no point gathering because that's not what church is about. It's not about coming here to feel good on a Sunday and then go about the rest of our week. It's about coming here on a Sunday to be filled up with the Holy Spirit, to encounter the living God so that we can go out and make a difference out there. Now, you may remember, I think it's two, two years ago, I'm bringing this out again. 
I haven't tried this, it might not work. We had some building blocks that, we, that the PCC felt the Lord was saying to us. And you'll see, if you remember what they are, or if you don't remember, hopefully if this works, they are our five building blocks. <laughs> Told you I'd not practice this. They are our five building blocks. What's the third one? Discipleship. That's why it's important that we focus on our discipleship. But through the exploration of James, we'll see that we have to be Christ-centered and that we have to love one another. The challenge of faith, as James says, is not to be like a wave. Because the waves uh, will go by what, what is going on in the world. We'll get rocked from side to side. Now, we know there are many winds and tides in human life that can rock us. The question for us is whether the character that develops within us is the real thing. Or, as James says in verse 6, we're like the waves that are unstable, blown and tossed by the wind. This is where we start to see when we live life as a Christian, it's countercultural to the way of the world. Because the world sways left and right depending on what mood we're in. One thing, one to minutes, something's great, then it's bad, then something else is great, then that's bad. And the world sways. But when we have our faith in Jesus Christ, we can stand on that solid rock, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. So that's what James is getting at, that we need to be on stable ground as we face the trials of the world that will come. Not that might come, sadly, I wish I could say that, but that will come. Again, Tom Wright, he says that the moment we choose to follow Jesus is the moment we expect the trials to begin. Yet what are the words we hear from James? Take you to verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I said this was going to be challenging. That's not an easy thing to hear. Why should we consider it joy when we face trials? Because surely we just want an easy life. We want things to go just the way that we want. We get fed up and frustrated when things go wrong. It's about one word, really. Endurance. It's enduring the race that is set before us. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Interestingly, in today's culture, endurance is a much admired quality. We're in an age of instant gratification. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like, um, I don't know. I don't like this phone. I'm going to get a new one. I can buy one. It'll be with me tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I don't like this t-shirt. I'm going to buy a new one and it'll be with me tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. It's instant gratification. When we go off things, we find something new. We can't be bothered to cook. We order a takeaway. We don't even ring up. It's really funny. So Hannah and Joseph love watching Bluey. And there's one episode where they're teaching their granddad who comes to the city. That no long, you don't ring up a restaurant anymore. You don't ring up and look at a menu on a piece of paper. You just use one of these things. That's how you order now. You don't even have to talk to anybody until the person comes and says, there's your meal. But it's the feats of endurance that really capture our attention. Over the summer, we've had the privilege of watching the Olympic Games. Athletes at the peak of their condition who've endured en time after time after time through injury, through illness, through endless, um, pra what's the word, practicing? Training, thank you. Through endless training to be ready for that one moment. And it always staggers me. The 100 meters, they train for four years to run for nine seconds. The marathon runners train for four years to run 26 miles. There is a complete difference. But ultimately, it is the endurance that has kept them going. And at the moment, we're really privileged to be able to watch the Paralympics and see some wonderful feats of people who have faced and endured all sorts of difficulties in life, yet they're able to compete at the highest level. And it brings tears to the eyes as you watch people win. There was a wonderful scene. I can't remember which one of our British swimmers it was. Or it might even have been the American. When she turned around and goes, what, did I win? I can't remember who it was, but it was in the swimming pool. 
Even our TV shows, reality TV and game shows, they hone into our relentlessly competitive drives and look at endurance. The heroes of our day are the people who are outdoor survivalists, who go out and leave everything behind and live Bear Grylls. They're those people who remain in their careers for many decades. Because endurance is something that we don't have anymore. It's all too easy to swap things around to make our lives that little bit easier. Because after all, we all want an easy life. A few months back, I shared with you that one of my guilty pleasures when I was, I think it was back in February, I'd been watching Australian Survivor. And I'm nearly caught up, by the way, to the current season. But that is a real test of endurance. It's 48 to 50 days in the Australian outback or on a remote desert island trying to survive. And I think as I was looking at James, I thought, perhaps that's why I enjoy this. Not the backbite and the lying and the the blindsiding that goes on, but it's watching these human people endure in really tough conditions to be the sole survivor. And I always think it's funny when they call it the sole survivor. But one of the things interspersed across the competition are what's called reward challenges. And the winning tribe gets a reward. And they live on rice and water for 50 days. And often the reward is something as simple as a cup of coffee or a KFC or towards the end a shower or a trip to the spa. Now they are very, very small items for us. I came into church, I had a cup of coffee, I didn't think much of it. But for these guys, they get so excited when they win that reward because everything has been stripped away and a simple home comfort of a cup of coffee makes all the difference for their morale. The host says to the losing team, head on out, guys, I've got nothing for you. And it's a moment that I always, I can't help but feel for that team because they've been tempted with something. Last night when I was watching it, it was a meal of fish and chips. But they've been tempted with something, and then they have to go back to the water and the rice, knowing that their other competitors are having something that is a home comfort. But it is the endurance that sees them through. So for us, friends, as Christians in 2024, it reminds me that when we are tested, that something real is happening. There are many different kinds of trial that we will face. Persecution, temptation, sickness, bereavement, family troubles, financial troubles, to name but a few. But unless we're doing something serious, we're not going to be tested. So how serious is your faith? For example, a mechanic doesn't test scrap metal. They will test the cars that are going out to face the tough conditions. So if we're being tested, it's because we are going out to face the tough conditions of this life. It's not because we're sat twiddling our thumbs on a Sunday morning thinking, isn't this lovely gathered together with my fellow family? When we follow Jesus Christ, though, we're not simply supposed to just survive in this world to get to the ultimate destination. We are supposed to count. Our lives matter. We are supposed to make a difference to the world. Whether that's through the quietness or ordinariness of everyday life, being faithful and gentle in the workplace, or whether it's speaking and acting in a way that reveals the gospel to others. As has often been said, for many, we will be the only Bible that people read. Are we reflecting Jesus in all that we do and all who we encounter? But to be able to do any of that, We have to be strong and ready to face the challenges and trials that will come. James draws our attention to the result of the test that we will face. Patience. Don't panic. Don't overreact. Don't turn a problem into a crisis. Be patient. That sounds so easy when I say it like that, doesn't it? But we all know it really is not easy to walk out that life. Another of those great themes of James's letter is patience. 
It's the one thing we always say. Don't ask for patience because God will honor it. God, please give me patience. A few months later, God, why have you not done this thing for me already? Oh, you prayed for patience, mate. You've got another two years to wait. I know it's not quite like that. God doesn't speak like that, but there we go. It's a really hard thing to pray for. But James reminds us to pray for patience because it's through our patience that we will endure. And that's really hard for me to say that as a, one of the most impatient people around. Indeed, if you saw me this morning, I was getting frustrated because the internet here wasn't working. I needed to download something. But never mind. Not only does James say that testing will develop our patience and perseverance, but we shouldn't just develop it, but we need to let it work all the way through our system in verse 4. Or as Paul puts it in Colossians 1.11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. That is the patience that is God-given. One of the other great themes we'll explore in parallel with patience is wisdom. James is perhaps the most obvious of the New Testament writers who goes back to the Old Testament in what we call the wisdom literature. The books which show us the wisdom of those who've learned to trust God with everything and discover how that trust would work out in every aspect of daily life. God gives generously and ungrudgingly to all people, verse 5. But we, in our human condition, project on the maker all of the human emotions that we can't manage. We project the fearful, the petty, the spiteful character on God, thinking, well, you're just like that. But we remember, James tells us that God is not like that at all. Sometimes, even it's when we look in the mirror, we see those things that we don't like. But James is telling us that we need to learn who God really is and what he's truly like and what his character is like. Because with God we will end up with a settled character of wisdom, patience, and faith. James continues by telling us to learn to trust God and his word rather than the snares and temptations of this world, usually wealth. Interesting, just this week, the lottery have been showing an advert on TV about Super Saturday, which was yesterday. There was a 15 million pound jackpot that must have been won or thousands of people would share it. So give us your money and pay the lottery. A pound for your chance to win. At least I think it's still a quid. And the lure of the 15 million pounds that actually probably nobody's going to win when all's said and done. Well, guess what? I didn't win last night. But that's partly because I never play the lottery. But I know that the money, if I was to play the lottery and win it, that money would not give me all that I need. Because that is seeking wealth. All that I need is found in the person of Jesus Christ and the faith that I have and the patience that I am developing and the endurance that I am developing to get the character that I need that God wants me to have. Because if I was to win that money, it could be spent and it would be gone forever. But God is permanent. God will never be gone forever because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In this day and age where God's very word is under attack outside and inside the church, we have to remember that it's his word that is going to last. It is his word that is permanent. It's not the word that merely conveys true information because when God speaks, things happen. Things happen to us. Things happen within us. Because the Word of God goes deep down. It changes us. It helps us to become different people. It brings healing to the inner hurts that we carry. It changes the, our inner motives, which has the human desire of wealth and power. It changes our character to desire God more and more and more. Friends, that is vital. If we are going to continue this faith movement that we call Christianity, we have to change our inner motives and heal our inner hurts 
But we can only do that when, by God speaking to us and in us deep down through the Holy Spirit. After all, we see people become rich and famous. Though we see them have fine houses, big cars, luxurious holidays, celebrity culture in all of its glory. And then the next day, that individual hits the headlines. They've embezzled all this money. They're going to prison. Hero to zero. In God's kingdom, that's not going to happen. Because God's word is permanent. James tells us when we find ourselves poor to celebrate. James tells us that we need to learn to look at the world inside out and upside down because that is how Jesus taught us to do it. So let's be a church. Let's be a movement of people who sees things as God sees them, not through the worldview of wealth and power, but at looking much deeper than the superficial stuff that the world tells us is what we need. But let's start looking at the world as God looks at the world, as God intends us to look at the world. Because that is how we should look. Because if we look at the world in that way, we can then start being a catalyst for change. We can start bringing about the change and transformation that this world needs. But it's going to take endurance. It's going to take a lot. And often, endurance, it's not just about the physical. It becomes about the mental capacity as well. A few years back, when I was running the half marathon in Cambridge, I remember getting to mile 10 or 11. That's only 13 miles. And I turned the corner by my college thinking, I cannot go on any longer. My legs will not move. And right there, I saw Amanda and a group of my friends from college going, come on, Tim, come on, Mark, come on, Adele. Because there were three of us running together, Mark and Adele. Come on, guys, you can do it. In that moment, it wasn't that I could step aside and Amanda step in and run the rest of the race for me. That's not how it works. That's not endurance. But it was that cheering on that got me to think, yes, I can do this. It's only two more miles. Friends, that's what the Christian life is like. When the trials come, we cannot substitute ourselves for somebody else, but we can hear the faithful cloud of witnesses cheering us on, saying, come on, you can do it. You can get through this. Whatever life is throwing at you, you've got this, guys, because you have faith in Jesus Christ, and you are standing on the solid rock. That is what we can hear. When the endurance comes, when, I, when we start to think, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this anymore. I can't keep going. There is too much stuff happening in the world. Just listen for our brothers and sisters saying, you got this, guys. You can do it. Just keep going. Keep persevering. When all said and done, James is grounding his teaching in what is true about God himself. God, the generous giver, the father of lights. Everything that lights up the world is a gift from him. The sun, moon, and stars come and go in their shining. But God's light is constant. If we look at the prologue to John's gospel, we know it's the light that cannot be extinguished. That's what he tells us. If we look back to Isaiah 40, he became our father by the word of truth. James reminds us that through Jesus and the gospel, new birth brings new life. It doesn't stop with us. We are just the beginning The first fruits of all he created, verse 18. That links back to the early harvest festival in the temple. The first fruits of the crop are offered to God as a sign of much more to come. So if we are the first fruits being offered to God, what more is to come? Perhaps it's when we finally see every tongue confess and every knee bowing at the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One day, God's word will transform the whole creation. Fill in heaven and earth with his rich, wonderful light and life. Our lives transformed by the gospel. We will learn to look at the world differently. Standing firm against temptation. Reminding ourselves that we are just the beginning of this larger project. James declares that God is amazing and God is pleased with each of us. That is an encouragement we need to hear. So, are we patient? 
Are we wise? Have we got faith? Are we ready to endure the race that is set before us? Or do we need to do some serious business with God as we journey through this letter? We're going to take a few moments to listen to a song. I just want to encourage you, as we listen to the words, as we listen to that song, be honest with God. Tell him how you are doing at the moment. If you're impatient, ask him for patience. If you need more faith, ask him to increase your faith. If you need help in endurance, ask him to speak to you and say, you got this. I've got you. Let's start this journey through James by doing some business with God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin this journey through this book, may you make us patient. May you make us wise. May you help us to endure through the trials and tribulations that this life will bring. May we be able to stand firm on your word and not be swayed by the world and its temptations. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you when the going is tough, when the going is easy. Lord, we recommit ourselves to you this morning. May we be the first fruits of all you have created as an offering of, the, of much, much more to come. May we see that harvest. May we see people come to know you. May we be willing to step out and be courageous in our walk of faith. Amen.